This is Create the Next from Pro CFO Partners, where every week we explore strategies and ideas for financial management and growth to help today's businesses put their financial picture in context. Welcome back to Create the Next. I am Chris Bentliff, and I'm here today with a client story from Alan Levy. He's the CEO of Alchemy Works, and I'm really excited to Alan as a as a uh, fellow marketing pro to sort of dig into all the things that Alchemy Works does. Um, the website lays it out really great in an elegant, simple way. We help businesses send seriously good messages. So welcome. Introduce a, us a little bit to you. How long have you been with Alchemy Works? What about Alchemy Works is so interesting and unique uh, among others in your, in, your, uh, in your station? And um, how do you enjoy yourself over there? Sure. First of all, Chris, thank you so much for having me here. I, pre- I appreciate it and glad to be part of this. Um, so I started uh, a company called uh, SellUp in 2007. Uh, SellUp is, is an email marketing company. And then I acquired Alchemy Works, 100% of Alchemy Works in 2017. Uh, and then we rebranded under a singular name, which is Alchemy Works uh, in, in uh, 2020. So, uh, you know, so I, I've been a part of this company as a whole since since I founded it in 2007, um, the the small reason just for the for the rebranding under the the legacy name Alchemy Works is Alchemy deals with uh, mostly enterprise clients, or uh, the historic Alchemy dealt with mostly enterprise clients and would do projects for them. While the the business that I had founded had an ongoing relationship with clients, we have clients for you know seven, eight, ten, twelve years. So. Uh, we didn't want to lose the fact of the Alchemy branding with companies like uh, eBay and uh, Disney, where they wouldn't know who we were because we had done a project with them three or four or five years ago. Uh, you know, so so we kept the Alchemy brand uh, and the sell-up clients. Fortunately, we're ready clients. They didn't really care what brand we were under. Um, the 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 business itself is a marketing company. We we focus on strategy and execution in email, SMS, push, and uh, and social. And we get in and understand is what the business is doing with email or with messaging as a whole and identify what opportunities there are for them to do, to do a better job. And so we, we've got about 125 clients right now, uh, 125 brands that we work with. We have um, a little less than 100 people on our on our team uh, worldwide. We're, we're a worldwide company, predominantly U.S., but we uh, have a, a decent-sized team in, in the Philippines and an office in London, as well as uh, uh, Montreal. So we, we've got uh, some coverage, and, and uh, even in the U.S., we're spread out a little bit, mostly in New York, but but others. But, but in general, we're a marketing company, and um, my proudest piece about the company is that we have clients who have been with us, uh, and a fair amount of clients have been with us for eight plus years. Uh, so once once they get on board, uh, we're just doing a good job of understanding their data and execution and, and obviously pricing fairly. So it works. That's fantastic. Congratulations. It's no small thing to have retention uh, for that long. 2007, Take me all the way back there when you started. A lot has changed. There wasn't really SMS happening in 2007. Certainly social uh, I think Twitter launched uh, maybe a year or two before that. What, uh, what, from your perspective, as you sit, has has been the most dramatic change from from when you started the company, and maybe even like, hey, in five years, I wonder if this company will be doing this or that, to where you are now. What's uh, what are the cataclysmic sort of major things that you think have really driven business transformation uh, digitally in that space? I, I think one of the biggest. Uh, business transformational changes had been the advent of the uh, abandonment messaging or triggered messaging, uh, whether it's just abandonment, cart browse, or even just a welcome flow. When when I first started in 2007, most ESPs, email service providers, those are the, the companies that send out the email, right? We um, didn't offer cart browse abandoned you had to go to a third party to use your to do cart and browse abandoned uh and uh even 
welcome messaging was clunky at best in an email service provider. So you you would uh, sometimes have to send out a message, an email that was just text driven. Um, so I, I think that's probably from a, an email marketing technology automation and, and targeting automation, right? On a response, I signed up, I get a different message. I have a brand, I, I, I visit a website, put something in my cart. I get a very specific message with that product and other products that are similar to it, or I browse the website. And again, I see the products I looked at or the category I looked at. And the, so the, the, the ability to uh, have personalization and targeting in automated messaging and, and, and those now account for anybody between 30 and 35% of a, of a company's revenue. So you can imagine, you know, if they didn't exist or pre, pre, pre them existing, that revenue was just gone it was it didn't, didn't didn't happen um there there is another change obviously the the advent of um mobile um or the the the, the change in mobile you know the, the going from simplistic messaging uh blackberry and and you know if you if you go back to the the palm products or the trio products or things like that uh, so the iphone and and the android system and giving you much, much richer mobile experiences than than existed back in 2007. Um, so I, I think the combination of of, of that, um, much, much more convenient for consumers to shop on the phone uh, for, and, and, and make a quick purchase when they when they get an email and obviously an SMS that, that that's been uh, a big uh, phone. It. So I think those are the those are the big changes that have happened. And then I would. I, I know you asked for one, but I'm sorry, I'm, I'm taking it oh, up all the time. It. There's, there's um, the 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 last change, especially for uh, engagement, has been. Uh, I guess I I, I, I kind of say this tongue in cheek. COVID or or lockdown, people became much much more comfortable because they had no choice in shopping digitally, um, and so they, they they there was a stat I was reading the other day, and I, I could be wrong on the stat, but it was somewhere around. 30% of millennials will buy their food online, um, you know, uh, exclusively. And, and that just like blew my mind. It's like that, that we've gone from a, a place where, um, you know, almost all food shopping was done. When you go to the grocery store where you're going to be looking, you know, if 30% of, of a group today is buying their food online and that's a, you know, that it could be 60, 70, 80% in 10 years from now. Um, so it's, it's, you know, and, and it's just not food, obviously everything else is just, you know, e-commerce has just blown up in the last year. You know, I love what you're sharing. One of the things that I, uh, I agree with and I speak a lot about is that the power of email marketing and messaging is in its relevancy and um, that personalization creates that relevancy and everything that you've said, uh, starting with the cart abandonment, which is if I buy something uh, or I put something in my cart, but I didn't buy it, I'll get a little nudge that says, hey, you're still interested in this. And even to the devices that we're using. Um, it used to be a much more clunky experience, as you pointed out, like with the old uh, devices. And now they're so elegantly just a part of the fabric of our day. All of this connects to the human element behavior, not technology, but just uh, connecting with people. Do you feel like there's a disconnect in the understanding of enterprise customers or non-technologists? Obviously, you work with a lot of marketing uh, firms and marketing teams, but is there a disconnect between the focus on this is a technology issue versus no, 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 this is a, this is a communications issue. This is something where we're trying to nurture people's behaviors, not just uh, invigorate them with gadgets and gizmos. What do you think about that juxtaposition? I, I, I love that question. So um, the, the, um, what, what typically happens is there's a cycle, right? So the cycle is new technology comes out. The new technology is going to cure all problems, you know, solve everything. Everything is great. I don't need to work with any agencies. I don't even need people to write copy anymore. It's all going to be done magically through this new technology. And then the company adopts the technology and the sellers of that technology, you know, have, have, have convinced all these people to buy it and it's not being used or, or it's being used and it, it doesn't fulfill the dream. And you know, then the marketers like us get brought in. Can you take a look at this? Can you help and say, yeah, there's a human element to everything, right? You 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 can figure out 
what the best of five titles is, the best of five subject lines is through technology. I can rank a winner. And we have we have technology ourselves that we built out, subjectlinepro.com to identify, you know, the best subject line with it. But we can't write that subject line for you. If there's something new or innovative that you want to come up with, maybe you were walking past the store or saw a gelato flavor that, that inspired you to, to, to put something in there in, in, into your subject line. It's never been used before. Well, technology can't create something that's never been used before. It can only possibly measure it against others. And so that we get brought in. So and that's a simple example, but but basically um, you need the combination when you're talking to human beings and you're looking for human reaction, you need the combination of human marketers to help understand the data and filter it and and use the tools and 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 move things along faster. So it's 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 always going to be a combination of right, right, right brain, left brain together. That's a great, a, a great illustration. And that's that kind of relationship focus. How do you feel like that extends in the modern discussion uh, to digital privacy and the, the concerns that folks have about sharing contact information or email information? One reason is because they've been burned by that through whatever unethical marketing in the past or irrelevant marketing in the past. When we're seeing changes to what Apple's doing with the iPhone, what are your thoughts on the sort of future of privacy or even the present of privacy and how we can still be good communicators and stewards of the the email address that we have so cherished in our hands um, with that in mind for the consumer. So, you know, companies have uh, a contract with the consumer, right? And, and you wanna sell the consumer more, you need to be very, very careful in how you communicate with them. You, you can't be intrusive. You, you should show them what they've left, left in their cart, right? But you, you, you shouldn't show them with their neighbor's name on it what their neighbor just purchased, right? That, that, that would really be weird, right? Hey, your neighbor just bought this, I don't know, and you, you, know, you should buy it also. That becomes a little like, wait a second, are they telling my neighbor what I bought? Or, you know, what, what, where's, where's that contract beginning and ending? Um, and, you know, this, the consumer needs to have control over their own privacy, hmm. um, but also needs to be aware of the benefit that they're getting and what they're giving up. So if I decide to tell a company don't send me any emails, don't communicate with me, um, and don't, uh, you know, and if there is any communication even on your website when I visit it, don't follow me, then I can't be upset that they're showing me product that's irrelevant to me and that I don't know when their next big sale is, right? And if I'm a loyal customer, I'm, I, I need to give something to get something. And, it, it, and you, you can only tell me when your big sale is if you communicate. Now, on the other hand, if you send me four messages a day and you're telling me about things that are irrelevant to me, then then you're a fool. So you need to give me the opportunity to opt down, opt into specific messaging, only tell me when the big sale is. I don't really care if raincoats go on sale, I don't buy them or whatever it is. So there needs to be a contract and there needs to be a, a give and take with the consumer um, and, and you need to be honest with them. Um, and then just to, to talk to iOS, I think you know, everybody is concerned now um, in the email marketing community that one of our, our biggest um, metrics, which is opens, email opens, is going to go away. It's going gonna, it's gonna to disappear with iOS because what's going to happen is iOS is going to show every email is opened as long as it goes into it, 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 an Apple device or uh, into an Apple um browser, so to speak. So if I, go, I, have, a, I have an iPhone um, and I'm using Apple Mail, everything will will show as opened to, to the end user. So if somebody wants to market to me as somebody who's recently opened an email, they no longer have that ability. Uh, and that metric has been a metric that most marketers, most email marketers have used as a, as a key indicator. If somebody hasn't opened an email in X amount of time, uh, four months, a year, whatever, then bring down their messaging or stop messaging them. Now you don't have that ability. So I think that's the negative that a lot of the industry is focusing on, but there's a positive. The positive, if every email was going to be 
opened, that means that I could put much more into the email. I can make it much more engaging. I can have, I have video and email and, and things like that. There won't be any latency. So as marketers, we have to look at these things. Um, we've created a, at, at Alchemy, the, what we call the JLo seg segment, which is just like an opener segment. Mm -hmm. And we've done the data, we've done the analytics, and we've identified how to create a segment without opens based on uh, you know, a, a, a series of other criteria, other activities that the consumer is taking to put them into this segment. And they're actually more powerful than than openers. So we've, we've, you know, made up for it. And I, and I think that marketers need to be aware that there's going to be more and more privacy coming down, more protection for the consumer, which there should be uh, at the other, on the other side of it, you'll have to figure out how do how do you make that really work for you? I just think that's a fantastic um, response. I think constraint creates innovation and you've, you're demonstrating that. And, and I agree that, there's a the sky is falling kind of attitude that we can have or a um, look, there's opportunities here and things are going to be different. And this is a this storyline isn't going to change this idea of privacy. And and that's not suddenly going to reach an end. That's going to continue advancing. How do we as messengers continue to be relevant uh, with the messaging? I think that you've got some some great perspective on that. Let's talk a little bit about pro CFO partners. So you've got a big organization, international, uh, hundreds, uh, some folks uh, working with you, technology, cutting edge technology, data. Um, I, I know you've been working with Mark, Mike Durney over there, <laughs> super smart dude. Uh, tell me a little bit about what brought you to Pro CFO Partners. What skill sets does Mike bring that has been really helpful or complementary to your skill sets? Um, so... Mike just brings it up a whole nother level, right? So we, we uh, uh, you know, have the traditional bookkeeping in place and, and you know, ARAP and, and, and payroll and everything else. Um, but with with Pro CFO and with and with Mike, we've we've just got this next level. We're looking into 2022 uh, by division, by profitability, by by each one of our, our subdivisions. You know, where where is where are we investing in the company that we shouldn't be, that's that's less profitable for us? And where are we investing in the, in the company that we should be investing a lot more? And so in order to scale this business, um, I need to get into the micro of uh, what what's working and what's not financially. And Mike's helped us you know, significantly uh, make that change and and make and make those adjustments and taken us from a company that in 2021 did its 2021 projections in April of 2021 to a company that's doing its 2022 projections, uh, prepping to do them now in September and October of 2020 of 2021. So we, we've we're, we're getting ahead and we're we're building out. Uh, multi-year projections, it's giving us the ability to really um, take the business to, to a totally different level. Have you been, I imagine uh, that you had high expectations as you should when engaging uh, ProSafo Partners or Mike Journey, but has that been a surprise to you? Has that impact um, been something that was a delightful, unexpected uh, bonus for you? Yes, absolutely. It, it was, um, uh, I, I, you know, I, I'll tell you, we had a, um, and, and, you know, you have to really measure the ability of a company based on um, challenges versus and not just, you know, not just positives, right? Uh. So um, initially, we, you know, uh, um, Nelson, who's the, the founder, and I, connected through a, uh, a, a biz dev group that we were, we were both part of. And um, when I learned about the, his organization and, and we had somebody who he had put in initially who didn't really work out. And, you know, Nelson did a great job of checking in, how's it going? And, and, and uh, you know, he didn't wait until like, I quit as a client. Mm -hmm. He was proactive in the, in the situation and um, said, Alan, don't worry. We're going to fix it. And, and he, he, you know, asked me a series more questions. Asked, uh, and, uh, and, and I think we ended up with a, 
you know, a great in a great place because the first one, maybe I could have struggled to make it work. But the second was this was great. This was like Mike is like totally on page. And, and that's just, you know, how do you step up in the in, in the time of a challenge? And, and this was it. And he did it. And, and I find that, uh, you know, as we were just saying, constraint being sort of the mother of invention, it feels a little like that, too. Like uh, you were in a situation and the better you understood the situation, maybe better you understood your needs. And uh, Nelson and ProSafe Partners was able to sort of connect. And I'm so glad that Mike is, uh, is a powerful part of that equation for you. And I can't wait to see what you all do next. It sounds like really exciting times. Alan Levy is the CEO of Alchemy Works. Uh, Alchemy Works, spelled with an X, dot com. Uh, you've been so kind and generous with your time today. This is by far the most fun I'm going to have all day. Uh, <laughs> marketing guys talking about marketing. Really great stuff. I wish you all the best and uh, let's stay in touch. It's, it's great to meet you. Sounds great, Chris. Thank you so much for taking your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for watching and a special thanks to our subscribers. Consider becoming one today. Visit ProCFOPartners.com for more strategies and ideas for financial management and growth to help you put your business's financial picture in context.